Hey everyone, Minutia Minute here, coming at you guys with a uh, box set deep dive for this week's 365 movie challenge video. During Powerhouse Indicator's 5 year anniversary sale, I managed to snag a copy of the Fu Manchu Cycle. Pretty beefy box set. We've got 5 different movies in here, plus a book and some cards. I'm excited to dig into this with you guys and give you guys my thoughts on the box set the series. Now, of course, every week I need to make sure I'm watching seven movies. So at the top of the week is Batman, for which there's already a review up on the channel. This box set represented the middle five movies of the week. And then to wrap things up, I was trying to decide, should I go watch the Boris Karloff Fu Manchu? Should I watch the Peter Sellers spoof of Fu Manchu? And then I realized what better way to follow up a Fu Manchu marathon, but with the son of Fu Manchu in Shang-Chi. I didn't get a chance to see this movie in theaters. To be honest, I really wasn't that interested, but I picked it up when it came out on 4K, figuring I'd get around to watching it at some point, and I figured this was as good a time as any to dig into it, so I'll give you my thoughts on this movie at the end of this video. So kicking things off, I'll do a little bit of an overview of the box set. Uh, as with all of these powerhouse indicator box set releases, it does have a sleeve on the outside that indicates that it's the limited edition, my copy is 5,689 out of 6,000. We'll go ahead and take that off. If you guys want to look at the special features that are in here, here's your opportunity. You might have to pause the video because I'm not going to dwell on it for too long. I will talk a little bit about the special features as we go along. So then here is the spine, the Fu Manchu cycle, the cover with Christopher Lee, and then the various films inside the box. Here's the top, which has a list of the various movies that are in the box, and then the bottom, which features the credits. So cracking this sucker open, we've got an excellent perfect bound book in here. Tons of great articles. I haven't had a chance to read through everything, but in typical powerhouse indicator form, these books are well worth picking up the limited editions of the movies. Um, at the top, of course, you have cast and crew, just basic information about all the movies that are in here. And then getting a little bit further in, there is an overview of the Fu Manchu films of the 1960s by Tim Lucas. There is an article all about Harry Allen Towers, who produced and wrote the Fu Manchu movies. He famously bought the rights to the characters, but not the actual stories, uh, because he was able to get a deal on it. He got it for £2,500, and he was able to franchise the characters into five different films. Alright, skipping ahead, we've got Sax Romer, the pen of Fu Manchu, an article about the author, Fu Manchu and Company, uh, illustrates kind of how Fu Manchu fits into the pop culture lexicon of its time. We also get this article, The Exploitation of Fu Manchu, which is really cool because it shows a whole bunch of um, pop art from the period supporting the Fu Manchu releases. For example, there's this record, Don't Fool with Fu Manchu. There was a campaign, Fu Manchu for Mayor, during the New York mayoral campaign from 1965. And they had this poster up in like bus stations and things like that, um, which they used to sell the first film in the series. It was actually a really big hit in the United States. Dublin's famous jail becomes the Imperial Palace of Shanghai, which is a great little article about some of the location shooting that they did for the films. Then we get an overview of the various cast members from the Fu Manchu movies, the various directors of the Fu Manchu movies, critical responses to the films, and that about brings us down to the end of it. Uh, this is getting into some of the special features that are included, because there are some uh, other silent Fu Manchu movies that are included in the set, which is kind of cool. So yeah, and then here, <clears throat> and then finally there's this little piece on the silent era and Fu Manchu. So yeah, just a really invaluable little booklet. I've read through some of it, I haven't had a chance to read through everything. Um, but just a great way to educate yourself on Fu Manchu in the 60s, Christopher Lee, Harry Allen Towers, all the key players from this series 
all of whom were really important to this era of film history. All right, next up, we have got a poster, which I actually haven't looked at this. We're not going to get a good look at it here probably either. But it looks like we have a poster for The Face of Fu Manchu, which is the first film in the series. As you can see, this is where the art for the box comes from. And then on the back, we have a poster for the second film in the series, The Brides of Fu Manchu. Sorry, I can't give you guys a better look at the poster. Next up, we have a series of art cards, which I believe are all promotional stills from the film, but we'll take a look. I'm not sure if I've actually looked at these yet. So we've got Christopher Lee on his Oriental throne. Headshot of Christopher Lee as Fu Manchu. This is a still from the third film in the series, Vengeance of Fu Manchu. We have a headshot of Su Chin, who plays the daughter of Fu Manchu. Uh, this actor, in my opinion, actually steals the show in these movies. Um, she's absolutely fantastic. The only actual Asian actor that's in the movies. Unfortunately, she looks back very negatively on this experience. Uh, she felt like she betrayed her race by, you know, being a part of this obviously xenophobic character, which we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the movies. But nevertheless, like, she really puts on a fantastic performance. And if you just think of, you know, these two characters as being without, you know, an ethnicity and they're just evil supervillains, um, she's one of the best. Like, she really does an amazing job and she's just dripping with evil throughout the course of these movies. All right, and then lastly, I don't remember which movie this is from. I think it's from The Blood of Fu Manchu, but don't quote me on that. Uh, you'll find as I'm reviewing these movies, they uh, really blend together. And then that leaves us with the five films in the series, which we will go through here in chronological order, and I'll show them off kind of as we go. So first up, we have The Face of Fu Manchu. Uh, you can see we've got the uh, British artwork on the front here. And then if you open it up, you've got this sort of digibook thing, uh, which has the German artwork on the inside. Now, these movies were actually West German UK co-productions. <clears throat> so you can see the title of the movie is a little bit different in West Germany. It was called I, Dr. Fu Manchu. Then behind the disc, we have some additional pulp artwork. So before we get into the review of this actual movie, I just wanted to make a quick note on like, you know, is Fu Manchu racist? Now there's something to be said for, you know, movies in the context of when they came out, right? Is it fair to call something racist if it came out during a time when, you know, the stuff going on wasn't racist? Like, for example, the jazz singer with blackface in it. It just meant something different at the time than it does when we look back on it now. Um, Fu Manchu is just straight up racist. <laughs> um, there's really not a lot of wiggle room here. But the core concept of Fu Manchu really comes out of what was called in Great Britain, at least, the Yellow Panic. Um, there was a fear that, you know, China was gonna take over British imperialist culture, um, and there was a lot of fear around it. Uh, if you look at the novels, which I've never read the novels, but they talk a little bit about them in the extras, the description of Fu Manchu is very overtly racist. Um, and the author sort of argues that he didn't mean to be racist, but uh... but when you hear the description of his character and the assertions that, you know, he's evil because he's Chinese, there's really no way to backpedal that. My interest in picking up this box set was very much around, you know, a love of pulp fiction and wanting to dig into that a little bit more. Just because something, you know, maybe comes from an ugly place doesn't mean there can't be value in that. And actually, I was surprised when going through the films um, that they weren't as offensive as I was kind of expecting them to be. I have not seen the Boris Karloff version, but supposedly that one is extremely racist, uh, to the point that even in the 30s and 40s, that film was censored because America was allied with China against the Japanese. And even after World War II in the 1950s, Fu Manchu was looked down upon, was heavily censored, uh, and 
considered problematic in a time when, you know, the word problematic didn't have the meaning that it has today. Which brings us to the face of Fu Manchu, because, you know, it's the mid-60s, and when it came out, it was seen as a throwback return to, you know, the pulp era of yesteryear. Uh, it was the kind of movie that your dad wanted to go see, is kind of the way I picture it, at least, based on how various film historians talk about it in the extras. In the United Kingdom, it got a U rating because it was seen as an adventure throwback movie and not like a violent hammer movie, which it actually has a lot of ties to. And in fact, it's directed by Don Sharp, who worked on Kiss of the Vampire, among many other hammer movies of the era. Basically, the plot of this movie is... Fu Manchu has a chemical weapon that he's going to use against the British if they don't cop to his demands. Other than a vague sense of desire for world domination, what it is exactly that he wants is pretty unclear throughout the course of the movie. His nemesis, Nayland Smith, who works for Scotland Yard, is on his trail because he kidnaps a scientist and his daughter, who he needs to complete his chemical weapon formula to wreak havoc upon British society. Now remember that plot, because you're going to hear that many more times after this. To be honest, as I was watching this movie, um, Fu Manchu's the best character, really. Like, he's the most interesting. You know, he is a super villain, but he's gentlemanly, very capable. The character has a lot of qualities that are actually, in some ways, appealing, even though, of course, you know, he's like a James Bond-level super villain. In contrast, uh, Nayland Smith who is his arch nemesis in the whole series, is played by Nigel Green, um, who comes off as a piece of dry toast, to be honest, throughout the course of the whole movie. When I was watching the extras for this film, in one of the featurettes, someone was talking about how Nigel Green was by far the best Nayland Smith cast in the series, and I immediately went, oh no, <laughs> because he was not appealing really at all to me. Um, in the course of this movie. And it's interesting because Sax Romer, when he created Fu Manchu, was trying to create a Professor Moriarty. Like, he felt like there was a gap in the market for a great supervillain character. Um, but the thing that's lacking is a great hero for him to butt up against. And it seems like usually it's the other way around. Like, you come up with a great hero, and then sometimes the villain is underwhelming. James Bond seems to be the only character to really effectively do both consistently. Um, and the big thing holding this back from being a big, broad, James Bond-style spectacle is the fact that Nayland Smith is in, in no way a great James Bond. As far as the filmmaking goes here, Don Sharp does a satisfactory job as director. The film is set in 1925, and for the most part, despite the film's low budget, I'm fairly convinced it feels like it's 1925. There are some gaffes throughout the course of the movie that are like, ah, oh, that's definitely not 19, 1925. But, uh, but for the most part, it's pretty convincing. The gaps are not, like, glaringly obvious. So, overall, it's fairly successful on that front. Skipping ahead to The Brides of Fu Manchu, the second film in the series, also directed by Don Sharp, um, but unfortunately not nearly as successful from a filmmaking perspective, particularly because of their inability to successfully adhere to the time period. Um, unlike the first film, they really, really struggled <laughs> with uh, convincing you that this was taking place in... I guess this one technically should be a prequel because it centers around the founding of Interpol, which was in 1923. Um, but, I mean, you can even see actually on the box art here... Like, these women are clearly from the 1960s, wearing 1960s attire. Um, this has a subplot where, you know, the brides of Fu Manchu are captives, and he's bending them to his will. And the dungeon in which they're kept is straight out of the 1960s. Like, there's, it looks like it could be an episode of the Batman TV show if he ever went up against Fu Manchu. Now, ultimately, the brides themselves of Fu Manchu are basically the subplot. Um, he's kidnapped these women, but what he's really after is their parents. He's trying to blackmail their families into working with him to build a death ray, which he needs in order to make sure that uh, Great Britain does what he wants whenever he wants uh, in his quest for total global domination, which again, continues to be unquantified and unclear. Uh, of course, at the end, Nayland Smith shows up, they destroy the death ray, 
Um, this one, even though it's a mess, is actually probably a little bit more fun to watch than the face of Fu Manchu. It definitely feels a bit more problematic because of the portrayal of, you know, Fu Manchu's opium den where he's, you know, controlling these women. Uh, it's very stereotypical. What the film has going for it is a great James Bond style plot. There is a James Bond style layer with a bunch of levers that they're using to make this death ray work. Uh, it feels very Dr. No, actually, uh, which was kind of appealing, just like the absolute no-budget version of a James Bond movie, which made it a bit laughable. Uh, Burt Kwok, who is in the Pink Panther movies as Kato, uh, makes an appearance in this movie, which is quite welcome. And overall, it was silly, it was sleazy, kind of fun to watch, although, you know, in an ironic way more than anything. The biggest thing holding this film back from being as good as the first one is the failure to stick to the time period your movie set in and the casting of Douglas Wilmer as Nayland Smith, uh, who really does not work in the role for me. Um, unfortunately, after he's replaced in the fourth film, it actually, believe it or not, gets worse. Um, but he plays it kind of like a school teacher. Uh, really just not right. Uh, at least Nigel Green, as boring as his performance was, uh, was a man of action, right? Um... Douglas Wilmer is not that. Like, he seems like he should be, you know, sitting in an armchair smoking a pipe rather than out on these exotic adventures, which, uh, of course, take place all over the world. Uh, but in the case of these first two movies, uh, are all shot completely in Ireland, which is pretty funny when Fu Manchu's Oriental Castle looks like, you know, Blarney Castle. <laughs> um, pretty funny. All right, and then that brings us to the third film of the franchise, The Vengeance of Fu Manchu. This is now directed by Jerry Summers. We have a new director in the director's chair. And um, this one was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, this is actually probably the one I thought was the most entertaining. Again, the first one being of the most quality. Um, but this one, uh, really giving it a run for its money in terms of just, you know, corny B-movie pulp fiction uh, brought to life. The plot of this film really resolve the plot of this film really revolves around um Fu Manchu trying to get revenge on Naylan Smith after being foiled so many times in the past and through plastic surgery he creates a doppelganger for him and his whole plan is he's going to send this doppelganger out he's going to have the doppelganger commit a murder and on the day the doppelganger is executed for the murder he is then going to execute Naylan Smith who he captures partway through the movie. Um, one of the most convoluted premises I have ever heard of for any movie, um, but it was a joy to watch. Um, the direction in this is just a little bit snappier than Don Sharp for whatever reason, just a little bit more kinetic. Uh, once again, you have just a mixture of timelines. You know, it's still supposed to be set in the 20s, but, you know, you got all kinds of random stuff going on in this movie. Um, this is the last one where it felt like they really put some effort in, and it gets bonus points for having actually been shot in Hong Kong. So at least you get a little bit more of, you know, atmosphere in this movie than you do in either of the prior two. All right, next up, the final pair of films are both directed by Jess Franco. So first we have The Blood of Fu Manchu, which I um, have never seen a movie directed by Jess Franco before, at least to my knowledge. This was my first one, and um, I'm excited to explore his career more. I'm going to be doing a week of his movies at some point in the future. I uh, just haven't gotten the chance to do it yet. I'm not sure if this is the best representation of his work by any means, um, because this was a very dull movie. Um uh, to be honest, I don't even really remember what happens in it, and I just watched it a couple of days ago. The gist of this is, once again, Fu Manchu is trying to get revenge on Naylan Smith. Uh, and the way he goes about doing it this time is, once again, he has a harem of girls uh, that he poisons with snakes <clears throat> and poisons them so much that it turns their kiss into a poisonous kiss. And so then they go out and kiss people, and it causes them to be blind, and then somehow... Their blindness is going to turn into death when Fu Manchu's plot is complete. I can't remember exactly how he goes about that. If you're a fan of Nayland Smith, this is definitely not the movie for you because he's blind through the whole movie and doesn't really do a whole lot. I haven't talked much about his sidekick, Petri, um, but the same actor plays Petri throughout the course of the whole series. He's sort of his Watson, um, and 
that character just goes off the deep end in this movie. He becomes sort of a Nigel Bruce, only not funny or entertaining in any way. And that, of course, happens right when he sort of becomes the main focus of the movie, uh, which just makes for a grinding experience. Um, the direction in this is interesting. You can tell there's just a little bit more of a psychedelic flair to it. Um, but, you know, it's somewhat limited by the material. The next film, Castle of Fu Manchu, um, also terrible, but at least Jess Franco in this does a better job of being Jess Franco. At least my understanding of what Jess Franco is like. Uh, you get a lot of tinted lighting, lots of dry ice and smoke. Some interesting cuts and edits. Um, much more kinetic, much more auteur than his first outing with the blood of Fu Manchu. The other nice thing about this final outing is that the plot does not just revolve around um, Fu Manchu trying to get revenge on Nayland Smith, but instead he once again has aspirations of world domination. This time his plan is Probably the funniest of all, which is that he's going to freeze the oceans into one giant ice block in order to bring the various world powers to his heel so he can complete his quest for world domination. Once again, what he really wants to turn the world into continues to be unclear. He's foiled at the end by Nayland Smith, no big surprise there. While the direction in this has a lot more of a Jess Franco flourish to it, uh, you can tell they are on a shoestring budget. Absolutely, you know, the money... The money has clearly run out by the time they got to this fifth and final film, and they really limp to the finish line. Uh, there's a ton of stock footage in this, as well as footage from other movies, including black and white movies that they just tint, uh, like brown or blue, kind of depending on what the context of the scene is. There's a moment near the beginning of the movie where Fu Manchu sinks a ship, and it's literally footage from A Night to Remember, <laughs> which is uh, pretty questionable. All in all, this ended up being a real drag ending for the franchise. So now the million dollar question is, can I recommend watching these Fu Manchu movies? Um, in good conscience, I don't know that I can. It really depends on what you want to get out of them. I mean, they're, they're a piece of history, even if elements of it can be offensive. Um, to a certain degree, I'm actually kind of surprised that Fu Manchu, as strong of a character as he is, hasn't kind of been reappropriated. But of course, that's easy for me to say as, you know, some white dude talking about Fu Manchu. Um, <clears throat> as far as this box set goes, I would give it a 10 out of 10. Absolutely stellar presentation of these movies. And the extras on it are really, really good. They do a good job putting these movies in context. They don't shy away from sort of the problematic nature of them. Some film historians on here who are featured clearly are fans of these movies from when they were kids. They grew up with them. And they kind of tie themselves in knots to make excuses about the movies. Uh, but ultimately, they do own up to, you know, what the issues are with them. Some of them very openly so, which was cool to see. Um, this is a box set worth owning just for the various interviews and documentaries that are featured on here. Because every single movie features extended interviews with film historians, as well as the actual filmmakers who made these movies. Uh, you get interviews with the producer, the various directors, the clapper guy, actors, just all kinds of great stuff featured inside this box set. Probably my favorite extra on here um, is the silent short film. I can't remember what it was called now, um, but it was the 10th chapter in one of the Fu Manchu serials that ran back in the day. And it was extremely eerie to watch. They gave it a new score that's like very atmospheric, but also has kind of a prog rock element to it that really elevated the material. Um, and, you know, I started watching it and I was like, I probably won't finish this. I'll just get a flavor of it and kind of move on. And, you know, it ran for, I want to say, like 36 minutes, and I just ate up the whole thing, primarily because I was just listening to the music. So props to Indicator for putting that together. Really interesting stuff, and a very interesting, if not troublesome, box set to have in the collection. So that just leaves me with one more review for you guys, and that is Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Um, I was not very interested in seeing this movie, primarily because I really enjoy martial arts movies, and I knew that this movie was going to be not a good martial arts movie, but it was going to pretend to be. Um, brutal honesty here. This is where, I hope you guys forgive me, but to be honest, I got less enjoyment watching this movie than I did out of all the Fu Manchu movies, in all honesty. Uh, I just found the movie frustrating. 
Um, I guess positives, you know, Michelle Yeoh is a fantastic actress. You know, I love her work. I first became familiar with her in her appearance in Tomorrow Never Dies, and I went back, I saw Super Cop, and she's been one of my favorite actors ever since. And of course, she's going to give a great performance in this. Tony Lang, also in this movie. I just watched a few of his movies during John Woo week. I'm primarily familiar with him based on his work with John Woo. Another actor I really, really like, um, he was in A Bullet to the Head, which he gave a stunning performance for, and he does a decent job in Shang-Chi. The problem with this movie is everything is very surface level. The script definitely does a good job checking the boxes of, you know, family drama, action, comedy, spectacle, but no one element of the movie really rises above to make the movie greater than the sum of its parts, uh, which is why this movie was so frustrating to watch, because it's kind of the worst type of bad movie in that it's just blah. Like, it just does nothing. As terrible as Fu Manchu was, you know, they're pretty engaging to watch. For example, Aquafine is in this, and the first movie I saw her in was Crazy Rich Asians, in which she plays a character not dissimilar from the character she plays in Shang-Chi, except this is like the bargain basement, low-rent, unfunny crap version of that character <laughs> and it's just infuriating uh the film has a lot of martial arts which is nice um but you know everything is bolstered with a very thick veneer of cgi distracting camera angles um and it just takes away from the experience if i'm gonna watch a martial arts movie like i want to see a beat down like i want to see a couple people really go at it and this adheres much more to the crouching tiger hidden dragon kind of martial arts movie where it's just very floaty, very effects heavy. Um, it's more of a ballet than it is like a brutal knockdown, drag out brawl. And unfortunately, that's just not the, you know, type of martial arts movie I'm very into. If you are into that type of martial arts movie, I mean, there's certainly a lot of spectacle to see here. There's a lot of action. When they get to the hidden village or whatever where Michelle Yeoh is at, there's a bunch of sort of Pokemon that are well realized with CGI and are kind of fun to look at. Um, but ultimately, this really felt like, you know, trying to replicate the magic of Black Panther. Um, Black Panther felt like it really had something to say. Shang-Chi just kind of felt like it was mostly platitudes. So, I don't know. What did you guys think of Shang-Chi? Did you enjoy it? For me, I tried to close my eyes and pretend that Tony Lang was the Fu Manchu played by Christopher Lee, and this was sort of like a soft sequel to those movies, uh, which provided a little bit of mental gymnastic entertainment during the course of the film but other than that i don't know this was a pretty empty experience for me uh which has been unfortunately a problem for most of the marvel movies i've seen coming out ever since really infinity war for me so that concludes my thoughts on fu manchu and his son shang chi i hope you guys enjoyed this video and i would love to get a discussion going with you uh what are your thoughts on fu manchu is it okay to watch these movies these days? Some tough questions, actually, to answer in this week's uh, movie challenge. So leave a comment below, like, thumbs up, subscribe, all that fun stuff. I hope you guys have a great week in movies, and thanks for watching.